Hey everyone, Nick here, host of 4Player Podcast, and welcome to the Definitive List, the only list you'll need this year. These are the best games of 2023. So 2023 was a big year for remakes, so that's where I'm going to start. Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space being two obvious heavyweights, and rightfully so, but when the dust settled, it was actually the remake of System Shock that stayed with me the most. A Kickstarter project that eventually matured into a beautiful modernization of the 1994 precursor to Bioshock. For a long time, System Shock has stood as a gaping hole in my gaming background, a series that has long been celebrated but remained hard to go back to nearly 30 years later. With that in mind, Night Dive, a studio mostly known for polished remasters and quite honestly doing more for game preservation than new game development, has spread their wings and soared to new heights with this remake. The game was a long time coming, but it ended up being an intricate, beautiful, stylized recreation of Citadel Station that constantly reminded me of what I love about the immersive sim genre. The complex level design and emphasis on player freedom remains completely intact, but everything has been improved, making it a much more approachable and enjoyable experience in the modern era, while not shying away from the more hardcore philosophies that made it a hit in the first place. The creepy mutations and cyborgs that stalk the halls of the space station combined with this dark, pixel-infused aesthetic and the emphasis on inventory management give it that survival horror edge, bringing its vibe closer to Resident Evil than Dishonored, I suppose. But talk about a game that doesn't hold your hand. It may look shiny and new, but it feels firmly in touch with its 90s PC gaming roots. It trusts the player to discern objectives, interpret the map, piece together the story, etc. It's a strong reminder that game design has kind of lost some faith in the player over the past few decades in pursuit of achieving mass appeal, a concession that Night Dive Studios clearly refuses to make. The end result is a gameplay loop that is deeply satisfying and just as rewarding today as it was back in the 90s. Ironically, many thought 2023 would be the year that Bioshock would finally re-emerge, but it didn't happen. Instead, we got an incredible throwback to the OG, which I can't recommend enough. Not to mention another game that'll show up later on in this list that helped fill that void. In fact, Bioshock's continued absence may be the only reason I gave this game the time of day in the first place, so in that regard, I guess I'm kinda happy we had to wait longer for that inevitable revival. But I digress. This remake was the perfect entry point to the series for someone like me who missed the boat the first time around. Its new coat of paint is beautiful, distinct, and goes well beyond being a mere superficial upgrade. Shodan, even in the modern interpretation, remains a goat villain, and I can only hope that Night Dive intends to give the same treatment to the sequel, a game that is even more beloved than the original. It's also a reminder that the immersive sim genre is tragically underrepresented these days, so when an experience like this comes along, I can't help but revel in it. This game kept me locked in for nearly 30 hours, so if you loved games like Bioshock, Dishonored, or Deus Ex, don't let this one pass you by, it's the real deal, and for me, one of the best games of 2023, hands down. As a huge fan of horror, Amnesia has always occupied an odd space in my mind. It teeters on the edge of greatness because of Frictional's ability to establish a mood that many games try and fail to recreate. On the flip side, it has always been mechanically shallow, relying mostly on writing and atmosphere to keep it afloat. Enter Amnesia the Bunker, a game that introduces numerous systems and mechanics without sacrificing any of the magic that made The Dark Descent such a landmark title. Set in 1916 against the backdrop of World War I, you play as a French combatant who is injured while trying to rescue a fellow soldier who has been injured in the trenches. After blacking out while looting German forces, you wake up later in a medical wing of an underground bunker to find that the power has gone out, the exit has been destroyed by explosives, and a terrifying monster is now roaming the halls and burrowing through the dirt walls killing anyone left alive, which is, at this point, pretty much just you. While the foundation of this game will no doubt be familiar to fans of the series, it diverges dramatically from classic amnesia by arming the player against the creature, shifting the emphasis to resource management and creative problem solving, and tasking you with surviving long enough to MacGyver your way back to the surface. In fact, 
They never expressly tell you how to do anything in this game. You're left to experiment and learn organically. Using physics and various tools or items, you can find multiple ways of opening doors, disarming traps, or slowing down the creature. Something as simple as a crank flashlight provides a guiding light in the darkness while also making you feel like a bull in a china shop trying to avoid a monster who's attracted to noise. When most of the game is filled with silence and the occasional tremor caused by the battle being waged on the surface, this trade-off ensures you never truly feel safe when venturing away from the safe room. While it shouldn't be surprising, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Frictional has absolutely nailed the atmosphere in this game. Once again, it's immaculate. Now, in some ways, the bunker resembles the non-linear design approach of a classic Resident Evil. There's a safe room with a power generator, which is centrally located, but a maze of hallways and rooms that branch out in different directions from there. It's your job to avoid the creature while you scour for fuel, which can be used to temporarily power the rickety lights that are strung up throughout the bunker. These lights must be activated by throwing a series of switches obscured in the dark tunnels, meaning that you must venture further and further from the safe room in order to daisy chain the lights together. Basically, the further you venture out and the more switches you find, the more valuable and effective your fuel becomes each time you power the generator. It's really fucking smart. You know, in a lot of ways, The Bunker is just the spiritual successor to my 2014 game of the year, Alien Isolation. It's an ambitious implementation of satisfying systems and mechanics, and your experience is only as good as your imagination and your will to survive. It's a glorious example of what it means when developers strive to grow and evolve established IP, and it reinvigorated my love for the team at Frictional. When this year started, I hardly could have predicted that a game like Dave the Diver would force its way onto my list and then hold strong against an absolute onslaught of incredible games. Regardless, it's without a doubt one of the year's greatest quote-unquote indie darlings, and perhaps one of its biggest surprises. It's mechanically rich and deeply satisfying as a management sim, in fact, I hear it taps into the same formula that made Stardew Valley such a huge success. But for me, the highlight was its relentlessly charming personality, and of course, the sushi. I love sushi. It's one of my favorite things in this hunk of rock we call Earth, and Dave the Diver found an authentic and remarkable way of tapping into that. In fact, when I play Dave the Diver, I'm hungry. Simply stating facts. Whether I like it or not, the game capitalizes not only on the appeal of the food itself, but also how it's sourced, prepared, presented, and revered as a culinary art. It's enough to fill the heart of anyone who loves sushi or Japanese food in general. But I digress. This isn't one of my favorite games of the year because it makes me want to eat sushi all day. Though that certainly does help. No, Dave the Diver is, as the name implies, a game about diving into the ocean and seeking its treasures. Those treasures just happen to be fish that you can eat. The loop here is well defined, but constantly surprising. It's broken down into days and nights. Dave goes diving in the morning and afternoon to catch fish, and then runs the dinner service at Boncho Sushi by night. Running the restaurant involves planning your nightly menu using the trove of ingredients sourced during your dives. Unused ingredients are discarded at the end of each dinner service, so planning the perfect menu is a careful balancing act of appealing to your customers through your taste ratings and price. On a macro level, you're also handling the hiring and training of staff, serving food and drink, and keeping fresh wasabi standing by. By running the restaurant efficiently and making profits, you're able to upgrade your diving equipment, essentially allowing you to dive deeper, mine harder minerals, find new fish, or upgrade the various weapons and equipment that you take on your dives. But that's not all. Every time I thought I had the loop figured out, the game added another layer. Eventually, spending money can even be used to upgrade the furnishings and decor at your restaurant, expanding your fish farm, your rice field or vegetable garden. And on top of that, there's social media management, cooking competitions, an underwater civilization, and a dramatic backstory to your head chef Boncho that was just a joy to unearth. This game is bursting at the seams with charm, beautiful artistic flourishes, and touching and often hilarious nods to classic games. It's a complete package that ends up feeling like a love letter to video games as a medium, and it put a smile on my face that I couldn't have shed if I tried. It sports remarkable depth, but also manages to say something about life, friendship, and the importance of doing what you love. That kind of thing is rare, so there isn't much more I can say about it. It's a special game that I think would be comfortable at the top of anyone's Game of the Year list. It probably would be the top of mine in any other year, but the competition this year was fierce. Hi-Fi Rush is without a doubt destined to be the most interesting new IP of the year. On paper, it sounds like a long shot at best, and a complete disaster at worst, but it somehow managed to avoid either fate. Tango Gameworks, the studio behind The Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo, made an anime-inspired character action slash music and rhythm game, and they shadow dropped it on Game Pass. Quite the gamble. But it justifies its existence very quickly. Within minutes of playing, I was captivated by its larger-than-life personality, engaged by its mechanics, and involuntarily tapping my foot to the beat. 
Talk about a game that makes a great first impression and doesn't waste it. The layered mechanics, infectious soundtrack, and lovable cast, all of it, just kept upping the ante until the credits rolled and my brain was turned to complete mush. In it, you play as Chai, an aspiring rock star who volunteers for experimental surgery to replace his disabled arm only to have his iPod accidentally embedded in his chest and be labeled a defect by the corporation conducting the experiment. As one grounded in reality might surmise, the result is Chai's world being transformed by the endless soundtrack that now quite literally pumps through his veins. Armed with his guitar, Chai sets off to take revenge on the heartless Vandalay Corporation, while the world around him literally swells and moves to the beat of a wonderfully catchy original soundtrack, one that occasionally features recognizable tracks from huge artists like the Black Keys and Nine Inch Nails. Gameplay is a combination of platforming, exploration, and combo-centric character action. It's an interesting design in that your attacks and movements automatically sync with the beat of the music, ensuring that, regardless of ability, everyone will get to experience the satisfying and beautifully animated spectacle that is Hi-Fi Rush. However, timing your button presses accurately with the rhythm will trigger increased damage, more pronounced musical layers, and even open you up to performing more complex attacks, so it walks a fine line between being widely accessible and rewarding more skillful players. But the heart of Hi-Fi Rush is, without question, its confidence, humor, and cast of all Bell characters. Chai eventually befriends and joins forces with a wonderful crew of characters, Peppermint, Macaron, Corsica, and Cinnamon, all of which could be considered highlights for Best Supporting Character of the Year. The journey they go on together is bigger than I ever thought possible from what I assumed was a small side project for the studio, and makes for one of the most heartwarming and vibrant stories of the year, without question. Look, I can't praise this game enough, it literally came out of nowhere and had me hooked. It exudes style and heart perhaps more than any other game this year, making it an absolute shoo-in on my list. Even if you aren't a music and rhythm fan, this remains a must-play. There's simply too much to enjoy and appreciate on display here. I promise you, you won't regret it. Not only do I consider Atomic Heart to be one of the most underrated games of the year, it also proved to be just what I needed to fill the Bioshock-shaped hole in my heart. Set in the 1950s against the backdrop of an alternate history where the USSR became a scientific superpower, this game puts you in the shoes of a war veteran who is brought to a futuristic research station to assist with the rollout of a new program that basically gives humans the ability to mentally interface with and control robots, and effectively eliminate the need for manual labor. Of course, on the big day, the robot populace turns against humans and murders everyone they can get their hands on, leaving you to unravel the mystery of what went wrong and help put the lid back on before the rest of the world sees it for what it really is. Not gonna lie, it is garden variety science fiction by today's standards, once again playing with our fascination with this idea that we're eventually going to doom ourselves using technology to play God. Nonetheless, like Rapture and Columbia before it, the formula remains very effective and affords us a wonderful playground to explore and engage with, albeit on a slightly larger scale. Which brings me to the crux of why I adore this game. Aside from being another welcome take on alternate history, it cracks the world design wide open in a way that the series that inspired it simply hasn't attempted yet. Exploring the open landscape and subverting the self-repairing security system reaps unexpected surprises, most notably optional underground test chambers that serve as intricate platforming and spatial reasoning challenges, distractions that all lead to rewards that are fun and well worth the effort. The world is also stunning and fun to explore, but the stains of government overreach and shocking machine on human violence paint a very different picture as you traverse a surprisingly restrained but completely reasonably sized open world, one that provides just the right amount of freedom to make exploration rewarding without also being completely overwhelming. Quite honestly, it's a balance that's rarely achieved in modern game design and it's a quality that I find to be underappreciated when developers do show this level of restraint. When the story ventures into one of the many facilities on the floating island, the design never starts to feel narrow or restrained. In fact, its unique identity just ends up coming into even sharper focus. It's a stunning world inside and out, and I loved it. With that said, restrained is not exactly the word I would use to describe the world they cooked up here. It's teeming with creepy, expressionless, murderous androids, humanoid laborers with face lasers, horny vending machines, giant spherical tanks, literal walking nervous systems, and of course, two faceless android ballerinas that serve as elite bodyguards for the game's central villain. Not to mention the trigger-happy old lady who flies around the world in a rock-propelled house. Between all that and the snarky protagonist and the bonkers electronic soundtrack, it's clear that it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it is a wildly imaginative backdrop for an exceptional first-person shooter, and for me, it worked on just about every level. So for me, it's a complete package. Weapons are appropriately crazy, encounters are frenetic, and the beautiful world they've crafted here has a tremendous sense of identity. 
I could go on because this is one of those games that lived up to and surpassed my expectations, which honestly is great considering for a while I was skeptical as to whether or not this was even a real video game. Prior to its release, it looks too good to be true, but it did that thing that we all hope for and rarely see. It lived up to the hype and then some, easily earning it a spot on my list in 2023. You know, no matter how you look at it, I think 2023 was a phenomenal year for game releases, and I believe it will be remembered as such for years to come. And even though it didn't quite top my list, there's no denying that one of the tentpole titles of the year will be The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Nintendo's stupidly ambitious direct sequel to 2017's Breath of the Wild. The crazy bastards at Nintendo somehow reused every inch of the original Hyrule map from Breath of the Wild and retained the controversial weapon degradation system while adding countless layers of innovation and mechanical polish, so much so that those gripes hardly seem to matter at the end of the day. Couple that with the stunning Miyazaki-esque story that pulls you through to the end, and it becomes easy to see why it has once again raised the impossibly high bar and changed the future of Zelda forever. But what can and should be said about this game in a relatively short amount of time? Well, first and foremost, anyone who was expecting a simple retread of Breath of the Wild was sorely mistaken. Tears of the Kingdom not only remixes the existing map in significant ways, it features a collection of floating islands in the sky that finally deliver on the potential that we glimpsed in Skyward Sword, and also includes an expansive underground area that can easily account for over half your playtime if you let it. Dungeon and Shrine design has seen a dramatic improvement over Breath of the Wild as well. In fact, it feels like Nintendo adequately and smartly addressed every issue I had with the last game, and the solution was never to just throw it out. Instead, the mantra was refine and improve across the board. It's an admirable and noticeable effort that can't be ignored. But the true brilliance of Tears of the Kingdom is not merely in its remarkable map design and stunning world or even its uncharacteristically deep story, but in the breadth of its systems. It eschews traditional Zelda design by giving you access to the game's core ability set right from the get-go, and then builds the puzzles, the dungeons, and the world around them in increasingly clever ways. Perhaps more so than any game I've ever played, it gives the impression that any problem can be solved in a myriad of different ways, that the solution is limited only by your own ingenuity. With the Fuse and Ultra Hand abilities, the possibilities are endless. Homing arrows, tanks, mechs, hover bikes, explosive traps, you name it. It's all at your fingertips if you can dream it. Recall and Ascend crack open the world traversal in the most remarkable ways, allowing you to scale mountains or reach the sky in a matter of seconds if you're smart about it. All this to say, the abilities in this game are absolutely insane and make one of the most remarkable Zelda games ever crafted, period. Quite simply, this is a sequel done right. It's a massive game with the depth of an ocean and the breadth of experience to match it. It's overflowing with Nintendo's signature charm, and the vertical playground they created is nothing short of miraculous. While I look forward to the next full reimagining of Hyrule, there's simply no denying that Tears of the Kingdom has once again pushed the boundaries of modern game design in a big way, reminding us why Zelda remains as important and influential as ever, and that's not likely to change anytime soon. It's hard to believe that the original Alan Wake endured nearly a decade of development hell only to land on my top 10 games of all time. It's even harder to comprehend that Remedy would ever return to the franchise that gave them so much grief, but here we are, 13 years later, and Alan Wake 2 is not only one of the best games of the year, I'd consider it among the greatest sequels ever made. It transcends its predecessor by making it for a game that is wildly and unexpectedly ambitious, while also honing the gameplay into something that is far more complex, multi-layered, and fun to play. Not gonna lie, I knew this game was gonna do something special for me from day one. Not because I think Alan Wake is a mainstream slam dunk, it most certainly isn't, but because Remedy was aiming to take the franchise into the survival horror genre this time around. And while the final product doesn't lean quite as hard into that genre as it could have, it certainly does enough to support its claim, making for a rare and successful genre shift. They darkened up the tone of the story dramatically, made enemies scarier and more unpredictable, and emphasized exploration and resource management within a semi-open world. Remedy even de developed an exciting new way of blending live action and rendered visuals to create a game with an insane sense of identity. At the end of the day, they successfully deconstructed a genre, gingerly placed their IP into its hollow shell, and then reconstructed it to fit that IP like a fucking glove. Alan Wake 2 is a haunting descent from the shores of Cauldron Lake into the deepest, darkest depths of the Dark Place, an elaborate and mindfuck interpretation of New York City that Alan has been trapped in for 10 years after the events of the first game. 
As he struggles to escape the dark place, a second playable character, Saga Anderson, is introduced back in the real world. She's an FBI agent sent to investigate a cult-like murder in Bright Falls, who is quickly caught up in a twisted mystery that ultimately weaves the worlds of Alan Wake, Control, and to some extent even Max Payne, into a now shared universe. It's appropriately wacky, super ambitious, and quite frankly, unlike anything I've ever seen attempted by another AAA studio, ever. And it works! It was a bold move, but one that I think has paid off for them in spades. But what makes Alan Wake 2 so great as a video game is the multitude of systems that have been added. It's no longer just a straightforward third-person shooter with cool vibes, but a game in which two branching stories from the perspectives of two unique characters progress non-linearly. Saga's path is focused on detective work, while Alan is more focused on mind-bending action in a noir, dreamlike cityscape. Saga can explore the town of Bright Falls and the surrounding wilderness openly to look for clues, and then at the push of a button, retreat into her mind palace, a mental interpretation of the clues and developments in the case, complete with a good old-fashioned string board for connecting the dots and deciphering the mystery throughout the game. On the literal flip side, Alan's world embraces his imprisonment and his skills as a writer. Instead of a mind palace, he can manipulate the world and the story as he writes it. That's right, Alan's journey is all about trying to write himself out of the dark place. And the way that concept is translated into gameplay mechanics is just so fucking cool. But both of these distinct parts of the game share a common thread. Addicting, over-the-shoulder, third-person shooting, and a heavy dose of weird. At its core, it remains true to the game that preceded it, but it shoots for the fences at every turn, and it hits its mark almost every time. In fact, I'm already itching to relive the experience all over again, and if that's not Game of the Year material, I don't know what is. So I'm taking a small step outside of our own Game of the Year rulebook with this one, but the fact is, between the massive 2.0 update and the release of the fantastic Phantom Liberty expansion this year, Cyberpunk 2077 has become one of the industry's greatest redemption stories, and as far as I'm concerned, it has more than earned a second chance at Game of the Year consideration. CD Projekt Red did the right thing after the game's disastrous launch in 2020. They hit the reset button and retuned the game from top to bottom, while continuing to layer new systems and story content, and the difference is night and fucking day. Perhaps most notably, the Phantom Liberty expansion serves as a clever detour to the main story, taking a dramatic dive into the spy genre that manages to be insanely cool while also adding even more layers and complexity to the core narrative in the base game. With this expansion, the core systems were completely retooled, making the game more of an RPG than ever before. They revamped and expanded the perk system dramatically, introducing tons of new skills and branches in the skill tree. Couple that with all the bug fixes and optimization changes, and you suddenly have a game that exemplifies the studio's talent for crafting convincing, detailed open worlds. Of course, the world of cyberpunk couldn't be more different than the high fantasy world of The Witcher. Night City is a corrupt, neon cesspool that runs on violence, sex, and corporate greed. And the way in which CD Projekt Red has brought it to life in stunning detail is, as Keanu would say, breathtaking. This world is just bursting at the seams with player agency and immersion. Whether it's choosing between cybernetic augmentations for your character, stepping into the first-person cockpit of numerous Night City cars, or threading the needle between open-world freedom and cinematic storytelling, this is CD Projekt Red firing on all cylinders. Like Deus Ex, which clearly served as a major source of inspiration here, Cyberpunk's playstyle can change dramatically depending on how you augment your character. For instance, I favored a leg augmentation that allowed me to charge my jumps and then leap high into the air. The world suddenly became vertical, and I found myself changing my approach to missions because of it. Characters would even comment on it from time to time, which I thought was crazy. I also love the augmentation that, that lets you tap into and utilize smart targeting systems in some guns. Whatever you choose, it means sacrificing certain other abilities or augmentations, and those kinds of trade-offs are what RPGs are all about. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Keanu Reeves portrayal as Johnny Silverhand. The long-dead metalhead turned terrorist living in your brain feels like a new highlight in his long and celebrated career, like a role he was born to play. And I was constantly astounded by just how much screen time the man had. He's an incredibly important part of the story, and he brought his A-game. When you finally delve into the Phantom Liberty expansion, Idris Elba shows up and delivers a similarly impressive performance. In fact, I'd say there isn't really a weak link in the cast. Pan Am, Judy, River, Songbird, Misty, Jackie, just to name a few. More impressively, V is a character that is fully voiced and fully realized while still giving the player a ton of control over how he or she looks, talks, loves, and views the world. Look, Cyberpunk 2077 is one of those games that's going to stay with me for years. 
If you, like me, felt burned by the game in 2020 and lost some of your faith in CD Projekt Red, I can confidently say that it's safe to go back now. How many games can say they crashed and burned and then rose from the ashes like a phoenix? How many feature not one, but two Hollywood actors delivering sincere, cinema-worthy performances in supporting roles? And how many games do all of that while also offering up exhilarating combat, player choice, and open-world exploration? Needless to say, it's rare. And I don't say this lightly, I think CD Projekt Red deserves a second chance here because Cyberpunk, for me anyways, now lives among the greatest games of all time. When Larian announced Baldur's Gate 3, we all felt that rare sense of excitement that comes when a studio and an IP appear to be perfectly matched. The team behind Divinity Original Sin seemed like the perfect studio to tackle what is essentially a translation of the world's most popular, most famous, most enduring tabletop RPG, Dungeons & Dragons, into a AAA video game. Quite honestly, I had my doubts. It seemed like an insurmountable task. How do you take something that is defined by its ability to cater to the imagination of the player and turn it into a video game without losing its soul in the process? How would you even begin to take the concept of a dungeon master and incorporate that into a video game in any meaningful way? How could you make the magic and thrill of dice rolls and skill checks into a centerpiece in a AAA video game without risking some of that mass appeal that you're clearly going for? Well, after years of working on D&D-inspired CRPGs, Larian certainly proved that they were up to the challenge. Not to mention, they had over a year of early access feedback and updates which helped them fine-tune this game into their masterpiece. Not only did they succeed in this endeavor, they ended up creating what feels like the most robust, dynamic, and engaging RPG of all time. And that's not hyperbole. As far as system-driven RPGs go, Baldur's Gate 3 is without question the new gold standard. Perhaps the only thing keeping it from the very top spot on my list is that there's admittedly a lot of the game left for me to see, having barely moved past the 50 hour mark myself. It's a lot of game that demands to be paced appropriately, so that's what I'm doing. What I can speak to though is the way in which the unrestrained freedom and complexity of a good D&D campaign has been captured, adapted, and packaged into something that has mass appeal. It's insane when you think about it. No game I've ever played has captured the addictive magic and thrill of rolling dice in an RPG like Baldur's Gate 3. I get little hits of dopamine every time I make a choice in dialogue or exploration that cues up a skill check. Even encounters or conversations that at first seem minor or inconsequential can quickly unravel into something much more significant, sparking new quests or opening new lines of inquiry to explore. Of course, those paths take you to some truly wild and unexpected places that require you to equip and prepare your party for insanely addicting and engaging combat. It's actually not uncommon for me to sit and plan a character's turn for five minutes or more, choosing where and how they move within the space, which attacks to employ, which spells to cast, or which free actions to take. Actions, I might add, that have on numerous occasions saved my skin in a fight thanks to a successful shove or a carefully calculated jump. Quite frankly, it's the deepest, most rewarding turn-based battle system ever created. And I may be speaking out of turn, but that might not even be a subjective claim. But of course, the real star of the show is the dynamic story that unfolds into an insanely complex tapestry depending on your choices and your chosen character history. Baldur's Gate 3 is perhaps one of the craziest water cooler games ever made. Even on our podcast and within our small community, there has been so much deviation and variation evidence when we talk about our personal experiences with this game. I may not have completed it yet, but the one thing that I can say with confidence is that the possibilities are truly endless. I have truly never felt my personal choices reverberate through a world like they do here. It's safe to say that two playthroughs of this game can easily unfurl into two wildly different experiences, and that is, in the simplest of terms, the goal of any RPG, especially tabletop. For that reason alone, Baldur's Gate 3 deserves recognition at the top of any Game of the Year list this year, mine included. Funny story. I didn't care much for Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order when I first played through it in 2019. In fact, I was almost completely indifferent to it. In 2023, I replayed it in an effort to convince myself that I didn't need or want to play Star Wars Jedi Survivor, but somehow, I just ended up falling in love with it anyways. On some level, it did more to rekindle my love of Star Wars than any movie or show Disney has put out in the past decade, excluding maybe Andor, but I digress. 
Survivor stole my heart by leaning hard into the exploration and player customization options that were only hinted at in Fallen Order, and combined them with a gritty, personal story that continues to make Cal one of the best characters in all of Star Wars. I'm not sure why I didn't see it in 2019, but I see it now. Like The Empire Strikes Back and The Last Jedi, Jedi Survivor succeeds by building on what came before it in unexpected ways, raising the stakes, and demonstrating just how dark Star Wars can get. Cal's quest to find a refuge from the Empire is born from desperation and darkness and taps into points of history that rarely come into play outside of books or graphic novels. When Cal inadvertently awakens a sleeping Jedi who has been in stasis since the Age of the High Republic, things go sideways and a race to reach a secret and inaccessible planet begins. To say more would risk spoiling a fantastic and consistently surprising story. I'll just leave it at this. Cal and his crew mean just as much to me now as any other major player in Star Wars history, and when the credits rolled, I was completely speechless. But as a video game, with gameplay, it also exceeded my expectations in almost every conceivable way. Aside from loading Cal up with all of the traversal, force, and combat abilities unlocked in the first game right from the start, it then layers on more of everything along with a rewarding stance mechanic that cracks the combat system wide open and ensures that every player's Cal is unique. I ended up favoring the double-bladed lightsaber and the brand new crossguard stance, but getting to that combination took hours of dabbling in the various stances until I found something that felt contoured to my playstyle. As you expand your skill set throughout the game, the planets you explore unfurl like a good metroidvania, all while enriching the Star Wars lore along the way. But perhaps most notably, the characters that you cross path with on your adventure can be recruited and sent back to the cantina on Kobo, where your buddy Grease has set up shop. As the story unfolds, the cantina gradually fills with colorful characters and quite literally comes to life in front of your eyes. It's mostly window dressing, but it provides a tangible sense of accomplishment and leads to plenty of colorful conversations with characters from all over the galaxy. Perhaps more than any Star Wars game I've ever played, Jedi Survivor succeeds at making the universe feel fast, dangerous, and full of life. It's really good stuff. Mechanically and narratively, the game comes together remarkably well and feels way more robust than I ever thought possible or even necessary. But needless to say, Jedi Survivor feels like an amazing accomplishment, and to some extent, a turning point for Star Wars in the world of video games. It stayed with me for months and reignited my love of the universe. Despite the stiff competition this year, it was practically impossible for me to put it anywhere other than the very top of my list. If you, like me, miss the days when Star Wars wasn't relegated to mostly multiplayer shooters or MMOs, Jedi Survivor is a reminder that Star Wars still has a lot of untapped potential, especially in the world of narrative-rich, single-player gaming experiences. It's also my Game of the Year for 2023. All right, there you have it. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. It's been another amazing year, and I can say with confidence that this was the toughest ranking I've ever had to crack, but I feel pretty good about it. I'm putting together another video with some honorable mentions because let's just say there were a lot of games that I wanted to honor here, but I just couldn't find room for. So keep an eye out for that. But with that said, thanks again for sticking with us. We hope you'll join us again in 2024. Cheers.